I use that for my publication. This is the real way to be identified. Open science is about identifying things and sharing things. Okay, um, and I would like to present you three things that you should read to understand the problem. One is directly uh, your, pro your problem is how often do cancer researchers make their data and code available? The second one, it's not a scientific paper, but it's a very interesting paper. It's the cost of not having fair research data. Fair means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And so, uh, so it's 40 pages document. And uh, sadly, to make a long story short, it says that every year, 10 billion euros are used to produce data that will never resurface. Okay, so every year, the Open Commission spend 10 billion euros for nothing. And if you want to be a scientist to change the world, it would be good that the data you produce are then available. And the last one is uh, open science saves lives. It's lessons from the COVID uh, pandemic. And so I really advise you to read this three papers. Uh, so this is what I plan to do. I will discuss about the context. It has already been mentioned before. Then we will spend a lot of time on research data because you can't have reproducible science if your data is not uh, processed the good way. So we'll discuss how to make my, your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And then we'll spend some time on data quality data analysis. And then we'll see what next. And as this might be uh, difficult, the beginning is difficult to hear, uh, I will finish with one success story to cheer you up and a takeaway list. So, um, main question, what do we speak about open science now? Because we have been doing science for decades without mentioning open science. And this is the reason why something happened. Scientists were looking at their uh, biology questions and they were not aware of a big wave coming. This big wave is a digital disruption, which is an abrupt shift. Uh, when I started hanging around in labs, it was this period, and the world was an analog world. And for the people at the back of this room, you have no idea what this means, so I will explain it to you. Uh, everything was analog. For instance, we have a spectrometer in the lab, and this spectrometer would print out on a piece of paper the result of my experiment. If I would run um, an electrophoresis, I would take the gel, go to the dark room, take a picture of it using a film roll, then develop the film. And every week on Wednesday, we received a small booklet called Current Contents. Everything that had been published during the last week was printed on this paper. And if you want a copy of that, you have to write a letter to the author to get the copy. Okay? So what does it mean? It means that everything was slow. Okay? And in less than 20 years, the world shifted from analog to digital. And what does it mean? It means that the amount of data accessible uh, was became very high and it increases every year. So this is uh, really, uh, some size. Okay, and so this has been shuffling the deck. The first cab company has no cab. The first accommodation company has no room. The first conversation provider has no switchboard. The first content provider do not produce content. And the first movie uh, provider owns no theater. Okay. And these guys, they have disrupted the market and they have made other competitors obsolete. So there is no safe haven 
If you are not prepared to dig into your description, you will be blown away. Um, you remember uh, La Redoute catalog? So twice a year, by the in your mailbox, you will receive a big catalog <laughs> with everything on it, and you could decide what you will buy for the next six months. <laughs> so they are not doing pretty well now. Okay, you you prefer to own Amazon or Laudut. Okay, so they were not they were not prepared. They do not exist anymore. Uh, so you have to be prepared. We have to be prepared. We were not prepared. And um, what does it mean uh, in, uh, in science? So there is a data debris. And because the high throughput techniques drive down costs and boost data production. And this is an example for the human genome. The first time it was published, it took 13 years and 3 billions. And it was published in 1990. In 2015, uh, the cost was $1,000. And it took hours. Okay. And so this is an important uh, figure. So this is the cost of producing data. And here you have a blue curve, which is the number of publications uh, mentioning sequences. And here it, the red one is the number of uh, published sequences which are uncreated which means that we have the sequence of a protein and we don't know what it does in the cell. And this uh, dotted line is the evolution of the curated proteins. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that the amount of data to be stored and analyzed is rocketing while the analysis performance declines. We are producing more data and we don't know how to uh, make something out of it. So we expect that the next generation, that's why I'm talking to you, uh, will bend this curve and make it uh, more enjoyable. Okay? We answer the easy questions. Now it's your turn to answer the difficult ones. And uh, so there is a new way of doing science. When I started, uh, you, you design the experiment, you uh, collect the results, and you analyze and publish. Now, you have a first step of massive data generation, then you try to organize, then you analyze, and then you disseminate the information. Honestly, I, I think during my, my PhD, I published two papers, and I Honestly, I, I consider that almost everything I did during these three years is in these two papers. Now, a student during his PhD, he will produce a huge amount of data, and he will not have the time to analyze this data, but the data is available. Okay, so we should do something for this not to be wasted, like when Tim mentioned earlier. And so there is a new, and there is also a new method of doing science. So you recognize Albert. So Albert, a lot of his papers were published with just one author. So he would like to sit in his office, think a lot, write something down, and sometimes he would say, "Hey, folks, I have something to tell you." And this is the author pages, the first author pages of the sequence uh, human genome sequence team okay so now we work with a lot of people and very often these people are not next door they are somewhere else somewhere else in the world if this is not enough for you we also have a problem of the damage of time and so this is a sketch made by Mishner in 1997 and we assume that if you ask a scientist the day the publication is made available uh, to describe the data he used, he will be very good at that. And as time applies, the amount of data the scientist will be able to explain will decrease. And in 2013, uh, some people decided to challenge this. 
And so they went back in time. So you don't need a DeLorean car to do that. You just have to read paper from 2010 and 2005 and 2000 and ask the authors about. Then you explain your data. And this is the actual result. And you can see that after 15 years, 50% 50 of the data can't be explained. So the data were produced and stored. And you can't use it anymore. Um, for the um, next, but uh, not last, uh, reproducibility crisis, it, it has already been mentioned. So this is an example when people try to um, reproduce experiments producing 100 top-level uh, psychology uh, papers. I know what you are thinking right now. You are thinking it's psychology. That's this one. What do you say about that? It's microarray. Okay, so it's supposed to be hard science. And in that case, they try to reproduce 18 articles using microarray uh, gene expression. And you can see that uh, more than 50% of the experiments could not be reproduced. And if you ask why, the first reason is data not available, but also software not available and method unclear. You have to keep that in mind for the rest of the talk. This is another example using uh, next generation sequencing. It's not very nice. And this has already been uh, shown. When people are asked, do you think there is a crisis? Yes, there is a crisis. And so that digital description, data deluge, damage of time, reproducibility crisis, is there a solution? You already saw that. Uh, open science is a solution because open data, you share your data, so the data are available, is available. Open software, so the software is available. Open methodology, so the method is not unclear. Plus open peer review, which is good to avoid uh, some problems that we, we had recently uh, near Marseille, if you see what I mean, during the COVID crisis. Um, open access, because when you uh, publish something beautiful, it should be available for everyone. And open educational resources, because there is no planet B, so we have to give access to education to everyone to help to find solutions. Okay, so open science. It sounds great. Uh, open science, I will focus on data. Uh, what is research data? I have no definition for that. I use the one from OECD. So uh, research data are the evidence underlying the answer to the research question and can be used to validate the result regardless of their form. It might include quantitative or qualitative, uh, collected during the course of the work. It can be experimentation, observation, modeling, interviewing, and other methods. And data can be primary or derived from primary analytics. Okay. And so, what to focus on for addressing this problem? We have to focus on data production and data producers. Open science is also a lot about people. Data science and data processing, and data storage, data management, and distribution. So we can say in that way how to redo here and now what was done there before, or how to proceed here and now to be able to do it again later and elsewhere. Um, so what do you have to do? Describe your data so it can be found and understood. Make your data accessible, make your data reusable, and make your data free. This is a painful part for some of you. Um, so this is how I will try to convince you. Uh, this is uh, my view of the amount of data produced during a project. So this is the quantity of data, this is the, the time. And the problem is data is produced by some people and very often analyzed by other people. 
And you see this guy, maybe he will join the project by the end of the project, and he will try to analyze data produced by this little guy years before somewhere in the world. And they will most likely never met. They, they will never be. Okay? So we have to do, uh, we have to find an organization, we have to find methods for this person to be able to understand how this was produced and how this was transformed. And we want the, the long tail data to be top quality data. And then we will use this top quality data to those publications, data papers, and databases. Okay. And so um, this, you have to describe your data. How to describe your data so it, has, it can be identified on the web? And um, how to explain your data to someone you never met before? How to make sure that a perfect stranger will be able to understand your data? That's pretty easy. Uh, how to understand that? Uh, you will use metadata. So if I ask you what is metadata, you will tell me it's data about the data. Okay. So this is a data without metadata. If you find this bottle in the supermarket for three euros, will you buy it? No. Why? You have no confidence. And if I go to, if I go to your house and I go in your kitchen and I remove the labels on the can. You will be upset and it will be more difficult for you to uh, plan your deal. Okay. So these are the metadata of this data. I checked, so it's a global line. So this label will, when you read this, you will be keen to pay maybe 20, 30, 40 euros because it's from Bordeaux and not from Bordeaux. <laughs> um, and so this uh, this metadata makes you con convince you to use this data. And if you see this, okay, you can always open this, this can to see what is inside, but you will never be able yourself to get all these information. And so what we have to keep in mind is that the metadata has to be produced, has to be uh, attached to the data by the person producing the data. The data producer is the best person to uh, create a metadata list and attach it to the data. If this, if this can leave the factory without the label, it's too late, okay? Uh, so we have files, we have tags, uh, one file can be uh, documented with many tags. One tag can be uh, used by many files. And in the, the case of a research project, you have a file and you can add tags about, for instance, the origin of the sample, the method used, and the um, uh, facility which produced and or analyzed the data. We can say it's tags or metadata. It's a controlled vocabulary defined by the group and scalable. Uh, this is an example of why you should use data for your data to be uh, found on the web. So this is Instagram and I asked for table and I got 4 million 300 answers. Okay. So let's imagine that you took a picture of your favorite table and you post it on Instagram with table.jpg. The probability of me being able to find your table is pretty low. This is someone using Instagram to promote his work. And what you can see here, a lot of hashtags, something. These are metadata. This person, to be found on the web, decided to add extra information to this picture. And so you can see its table, its furniture. Uh, it's in metal, it's welding, this guy is in uh, the United Kingdom and so on. So if you want your metadata to be discovered, you have to help the person to find it by using metadata. And so in a, in a research project, what is, meta, what is metadata? 
uh, another list of questions and the metadata are the answers to these questions. And so it's a project that happened in our lab 10 years ago. And we asked the people what kind of information you want to add to the file. And they say we want to know the genus, the species, the subspecies, and so on. And they decided at the beginning of the project to select what was allowed for the answers. And in that case, they decided to use Oriza, Sativa, and not Rice. They decided to use Musa and not Banana. And so these are the answers available during the project. All the other answers are not allowed. Okay, you can't say rice, you can say orange. And, and this, so this is about the biological samples, this is about the message, for example. Okay. And you can add, a, you can increase the list of the questions. And so, um, where do you find this uh, metadata standard? Do you have to make your own list if, uh, every time you start a new project? The answer is no. Uh, some nice people decided to think ahead and produced some list of uh, metadata. And you can go to the Digital Correction Center, for instance, where you have a list of metadata standards. So this is the alternative order. And the first one, uh, clever, they decided to A, B, C, D, access to biological collection data, and they will provide you uh, the list of the questions you should use. And uh, if you work on climate uh, forecasts, there is a, a list which is pretty nice, easy to understand. There is another website that I like, uh, it's fairsharing.org. And uh, here I just ask oncology. And I got a list uh, of uh, uh, standards you can use for uh, oncology studies. And this is one of the uh, this, uh, results. So the National Cancer Institute of Proteomics Data Command. And you have a nice uh, visual interface, so you know pretty rapidly uh, what they offer. You have um, a summarized uh, description, and you have the subjects, you have the domains, you have the taxonomic range. So you can visit the website and you will have the list of the metadata you could use for your project. Um, you have to make your data accessible. So your data, you have to keep them safe. You don't have, if you lose them, you can't make them accessible. And so you have to think about backup and you have to think about access control. So nobody will be able to modify your data without your knowledge. No, I'm joking. <coughs> Um, you have to keep your data accessible, so maybe you will have to run a website, and you have to make your data accessible all the time, 24-7, and maybe forever. That could be cumbersome, but there is an answer for that. Uh, it's called repositories. So data repository uh, is a storage space for researchers to deposit data sets, so group of data, uh, associated with their research. And most of the time it's required now for, for publication. Okay. And there are many repositories available uh, for research. You have inst institutional uh, dataverse. You have European uh, offers like Zenodo, which is a very uh, famous, and B2Care, which is a result of the EULA project. You have some global repositories like Figshare, some which are uh, provided by editors and some which are specialized in certain aspects of science. And since July, you have the very nice Recherche Data Group, which is a federated national research data platform. So repository services, secure storage for your data. So as soon as you have transferred your data to a repository, you are safe. You can lose your uh, laptop, you can lose your uh, hard drive, and so on. It will be safe there forever. Easy access, people will use a web browser. Access control, so nobody will modify it. They are harvested by catalogs robots, so uh, Google will know that they exist and they will be available 24 7. And the good news is the repository will ask you for the metadata, you just add it to your data. So 
we will be happy to uh, provide them with the data. Question How to find repositories? You go to re3data.org. And for example, if you ask for life science, you have uh, 537 uh, answers. And if you ask for uh, oncology, uh, you have 32 results uh, that are listed also with a nice uh, Google interface. And I uh, expanded the data access part. So you can see that these repositories, some of them are open, which is good for open science. Some of them are restricted. It means that you can decide to keep some control of your data. Some of them are under embargo. What does it mean? You can transfer your data to a repository with an embargo of six months or two years. It will give you some extra time for you to finish your publications or write your next grant. Um, and also here, the meta st metadata standard. If you are new to this field and you are you are not comfortable with what kind of meta standards, meta data standard to use, you can just click and look what uh, metadata standards are used in your field. Okay, and this will help you to select your good metadata standard. And so this is a focus on the cancer data. Before. So this is a general uh, tab. You have a description. You have some keywords. You know that this repository has already 532 data sets. And here you have uh, the term tab and here the uh, standard. So you see it's open. They use Creative Commons license. Uh, the restriction is about re registration. So people will have to let their name and, and mail out the email address. And uh, what you see here, it's important. It will provide you a persistence identifier, a DOI, digital object identifier, to your data set. And it's important if you want to share your data, it's important that your data set is uh, associated with an identifier, which will last forever. Um, should we use publishers repository? Maybe it's not a good idea to give them all that because they will use it to get more money. Um, <coughs> and so finally, you have to make your data reusable. Does this ring a bell to you? Face this format several times. Yeah, don't like. Uh, okay, so your data is useless if this happens. And this during a training, we ask some of our colleagues to list all the uh, data uh, formats that they use. Okay, so there is a huge variety of data in science. So I don't claim this is easy to solve this problem. Uh, you have to when you when you select a data format, you have to think ahead. Uh, is a specific software required to process the format you use? This software work online or after the installation of a computer? Does it require a particular operating system, Windows, Mac, Linux, or even a specific version of it? If you need a Windows XP. You open your file that could be this kind of problem. Are they related to a type of computer or particular instruments? For example, big microscopes, they usually provide formats in a very uh, specific uh, uh, files in a very specific format. That could be a real problem. Um, this software, are they free or you have to pay and who pays? Because this, if this is not you, maybe someone will stop paying for it. And so if they no longer exist, or if you no longer have access to them, could you continue to work? Is this, if the software publisher or the community help you? And uh, will the software will still be available in 20 years? 
and we'll be, we'll be able to open all the time. I wrote my uh, dissertation using Word 3. I tried recently because I have a copy uh, of my uh, thesis in, in that doc uh, format and uh, a modern version of, of Word can't open it. Okay. Hopefully, it has been archived uh, under a PDF format. And I have also a um, microfilm. Uh, so, there is not one answer to this part. Okay, so what do you suggest to guarantee the sustainability of interpretation of your data? What are the consequences for you and for all the next generation? So, for all the formats you use, you have to go through this kind of checklist to find a solution. And uh, um, so, my uh, dissertation is stored at the CINES, which is uh, uh, the Center for Archiving Science in France. And they provide a, a, a website called facile.cines.fr. Uh, facile means easy in French. And so you will, they will help you to find a solution uh, uh, for uh, many kind of uh, files. And you have what the one you should avoid and the one you should use. There is also this, uh, this is provided by the Cornell University Library, content type, and they have three categories: uh, recommendation low, medium, or high. So with all of this, you can try to uh, find solutions. For your files. So, what you have to keep in mind is use open formats as much as possible to facilitate sharing and interoperability. The format, when it is open, it is documented. If you have to use closed formats, you must ensure a way for people to access this. So, for instance, you use a microscope that will give you a closed format result. Maybe you should export it in using uh, in another format like TIFF, for instance. I am aware that sometimes you lose some information, but at least someone will be able to read it, uh, part of your results. And make your data reusable the smart way, so as open as possible, as shared as necessary, and you have to make it clear. So this is a license chooser for Creative Commons. Uh, so this is a result. I went through a, a, a series of questions and I have to, I have to tick boxes. Uh, so do I need help? I said yes. Uh, do I allow anyone to use my work even without giving me attribution? I said no. Uh, do, do I allow commercial use? I said yes. Do I allow people to remix, adapt, and build upon my work? Yes, and um, uh, sharing requirement. Do I allow people to change my license? I said no, and the result is here: Creative Commons, Creative Commons, attribution and share alike. And this is what I put on most of my work. Okay, and here is uh, the panorama of the of what Creative Commons uh, can produce. So the greener, the better, of course. But you can decide to uh, not allow people to make money with your data. It's up to you. This is this one. Let's see. The non yeah, this one. Okay. This, these are the Creative Commons licenses, but there are other licenses provided. And so, at the end of this process, your data should be fair. Findable, it should be possible to others to discover your data because you have a persistent identifier and you have rich metadata describing your data. Now your data is accessible because it is on a repository. If I and if I follow the persistent identifier you just got here, I will be uh, teleported to your uh, data set. Okay, it is operable because now you are smart enough to. Uh, provide your data in a commonly understood and open format. And it is reusable because you merely uh, uh, attach an open license to your data. Okay. This is what we have to achieve. And I 
can say it's easy. Open science, it's more a journey. Um, there is not one way and one pace to, uh, to reach this uh, goal. Okay, but this is where we have to go. And uh, now that your data is fair, we can now uh, start to ask other questions. For instance, we have to uh, discuss about data quality. You see these two beautiful curves. So you have the per capita cheese consumption, which correlates pretty much pretty well with number of people who die by becoming entangled in their beds, uh, in their breakfast. The correlation is pretty good. Okay. Do you think that the more you do it, uh, more likely you are uh, uh, susceptible to die in your bed? I think the answer is no. So this is made to uh, tell you that you should uh, remain curious and smart when you use a computer. Okay. You can produce a lot of curves like that, and there is a website made for that. This is actual data, okay? So you can pick a various uh, 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 statistics and, and create that kind of uh, stupid curves. <coughs> so you have to remain uh, curious and smart when you use a computer, when you use a software. Um, it's a Swiss model, it's a very good website. You give them uh, the sequence of a protein and they will send you back the 3D structure of the, of the protein. The problem is with this method, you always have an answer. But nobody knows if this answer, if this answer is stupid or not. So you are in charge, you have the brain, so you have to control that the answer is likely Doing something. In, in, in my lab, we use a lot of these kind of machines. Uh, you, you have many components with some microchips, with some captors, with some sensors. And sometimes uh, uh, the provider will ask us to update the machine. How do we know that after the update, the data pro, uh, produced by this drone is the same? That before the update, you have to keep control. This is not a black box. You have to think ahead. What? How does it work? Okay. You have to control even that kind of machine. Okay. Not just the pipette in the in the lab. You have to, to uh, keep control on this. Um, you will share data with your colleagues, and from time to time, you will receive a mail with a, a, an Excel file most of the time. And so, when you open the Excel file before starting uh, analyzing the, the data, you have to check the data. Uh, do you have missing data in this file, or do you have missing values uh, replaced by zero, or do you have incomplete series? What is an uh, the bit series, for instance, someone sent me an Excel file. Uh, Fred, this is a uh, use of pesticide in the, all the French departments. If one department is missing, then I can question the, the, the entire file. Okay. Duplicate lines or value or inconsistent spelling, the name of the people or the name of the cities as variation, not good. Uh, do you know that uh, what does it mean? One uh, one thousand nine hundred and one thousand nine hundred and four. This is a zero time reference for Excel on Mac and PCs. Okay, so if you have a date of a sample with that, it might be uh, a bug. Same for sixty five fifty uh, five hundred thirty six lines. You know what this is. This is a limit of old version of Excel. They were limited to that, that uh, amount of lines. So you might imagine that at the beginning, the file was much bigger and it was transferred from computer to computer. And when someone with an old version of Excel opened the file, saved it and sent it to you. So if this is this exact number of lines or exact number of columns, you have to go back to the source to find the correct 
uh, it's not uh, fine. Uh, for spelling mistakes, there is a, a very nice paper. You should give it a look. It's open refine, as, as you can guess, it's an open software. And you can be you can do this, okay? So you can say uh, is Andy Anderson and Andy or Anderson the same person? You have the brain you decide. So it's pretty helpful. You will so you will soon be recognized as the one who understands uh, computers. So people will ask them uh, you to solve their, their problem. So maybe you will have to uh, deal with encoding. The, seri the famous carriage return a nine feet carriage return it's in the good old day with the time machine carriage return. And so a uh, Mac and PCs that do not, that do not use the same system. And when you transfer them to a, a, a mainframe computer using Linux, you will soon learn there is a common called DOS to Linux that fixes this. If you start the analysis right away, you might have differences if the file comes from Mac or from a PC. If you are sent PDF data, so a, an old PDF from an old um, paper that will be difficult, and scan data, you know. For PDF uh, that old uh, data file, you can try Tabula, which is good at uh, be able to rescan a table on an old PDF. And sometimes you will have to give up. It's difficult, but sometimes it's better to give up. If the source is unreliable, if the transparency of the collection process is unclear, if you have unrealistic data accuracy, for example, temperature with four digits and, or unexplained outliers. If someone says, uh, I, I give you the uh, data I obtain on the bank on these rivers, on this river, but you see data here, you have to question the process. And sometimes, so you will, it will be better for you to give it. Um, then you will uh, move to uh, the computing center. So, the nice uh, thing computing center. Um, and every scientist is now a data scientist. So, you will do some computing with the data. Uh, I, I will not go into details about the computing science, okay? But for some people, computing science, this is this, okay? I have data, I have a computer running an analysis, and I have a result. For some other people, I have data, I have code, I have a computer, and I have output data. It would be better to understand that you have data, you have program, you have a computing environment, you have a machine, and you have data. And this is the key of reproducible science using computers. And that could be a one-week workshop. And, but most of the time, you will have this attitude. Data is my research, program is my colleague's code, and environment is the stuff I don't care about. Don't be that guy. And so, what remains to be done? This is uh, fair data assessments made on 59 studies recently uh, and published uh, last year in BMC and NC. So, uh, data with permanent and unique identifier, 21 out of 59, posted on a recognized repository, 31 out of 59. Data is actually available, so it's not that bad. It's 49 out of 59. Uh, archived in a non uh, in an open format, 30, with a good license, 46. Compliant with all the fair criteria, one. Uh, so it's not that bad. It could have been worse, but you know what you have to do now, okay? And let's go back to open science saves life because so this is a process research process. These are the potential issues, and this is where open science can be helpful. Uh, registered reports, so peer-reviewed protocols, 
that we mentioned are in open plan registration. I really advise you to consider this as a helpful solution. You will publish your research plan. It will not be criticized. It will be improved. Okay. And then open data will help to increase the quality and the confidence in your data. <coughs> Peer review will hopefully help to decrease the refractation uh, ratio. And so open science really covers a wide array of uh, research projects aspects. I would like to cheer up with a success story. It's a sharing of data uh, leading to huge progress on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I wanted to summarize a paper that it was so enthusiastic that I, I copied and paste every line, every paragraph on the paper. Uh, so in 2003, a group of scientists from NIH, FDA, uh, drug and medical uh, imaging industry uh, decided to work with non-profit groups for collaborative effort to obtain a huge amount of quality biological marker to uh, understand the progression of Alzheimer's disease. It was for them a big change. Uh, they had an agreement to share all the data. Every single uh, data pro produced was shared immediately. So no one would own the data. That was difficult because most of the time you have to think about funding and you consider the data might be helpful to get funding. So, as they said, it's not science the way most of us used during our career. But, and the collaboration at the beginning was considered as complicated. But company as well as academic researcher. Uh, decided to produce this, and they had a huge success with this data set, and they obtained very good uh, progress in understanding the Alzheimer's disease. Uh, now that you are convinced, there is one website I would recommend called the Research Data Management Kit. It's produced by uh, Elixir, and um, you can um, enter this by domains or role and so on. And you have a lot of uh, solutions for, for instance, preservation of your data or for sharing. You have links to uh, tools, and sometimes if the tools um, is connected to trainings for these tools, you also have connection to your trainings. And this is my takeaway list, which will be provided with the slides. Everything is clickable. And this is the end. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we have some time uh, for questions and comments. Hi. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. Um, I wonder, so I think open science is extremely important. But how do you want to get the people to publish their papers? Uh, yes, it's open access. Since we saw in the previous um, presentation the amount of money that you could get if you have maybe a possibility to publish in a good paper uh, magazine, yeah. Yeah, that's a real dilemma uh, because. I would say that everybody agree that uh, we should do that, but no one wants to be the first to start. Okay, it's like uh, in the swimming pool with the who is cold. Okay, and so we have to decide how to do that. Uh, there are some incentives we discussed about the stick and the carrot. Now INR will uh, require you to share your data. Uh, with the uh, Plan National Science Ouverte, which was published recently, uh, all your codes has to uh, be available on GitLab, so it's mandatory. Uh, I work in in I, and now when scientists are um, uh, they go through uh, evaluation every two years, now there are publication list of the papers, but also a list of the data sets and list of the code. 
Okay, so uh, we have many uh, way to convince people, and um, and I am here for that also. So we have trainings, we have things like that. The we all and and the European Commission they will be very soon uh, upset of uh, wasting ten billions a year. So if we do not change, they will change for us, and that will be very cool. I don't say it's easy. I think it's it's uh, profitable for everyone. I, I'm totally convinced. Okay, I'm not trying to sell you back on you, um, but we have to we have to work together. So it's more convincing the scientists to to do it. Yeah, that, that, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the the old people. The, we have some problem to change. Plus, uh, the digital disruption, we were not prepared for that. So you have, you have many uh, older scientists who are not comfortable with computing, who are not comfortable with huge amounts of data. You know, on our computing facility, uh, a student from South America finished his uh, PhD and went back to Colombia leaving on the computer 80 million files unaccessed for more than six months okay so it's not easy and if you are not careful when you produce your data it will be soon too late okay so you have to change your own habits you have to change the way you, you work with your colleagues your colleagues have to change the way they react so there is, it's a, it's a, I'm pretty optimistic because uh, the government, the Ministry of Research, uh, CNRS, NIA, and INR are really push, pushing um, this way. And when you will uh, uh, the, uh, try to get a job, and I hope, and I hope you will, you know, if, you, if we receive two CVs, one old style and one showing some knowledge of open science, uh, code sharing, and something like that. We will prefer this one. Okay. So thank you for some of the project group. Um, so this is a, a naive question, but uh, when we use uh, free data repositories, doesn't it enter in conflict with uh, the publishers? Um, when you select a repository, you have to read carefully the terms of service. I, I removed a slide yes, uh, yesterday called, uh, it's a, there is a website called Sherpa Romeo. So I will maybe put this slide back. And, and uh, so you, you select, at the beginning it was made for publishers. You select the publication and it translates easily what are in the term of service. And so you know what you give them and you know what you lose. And sometimes you lose a lot because uh, for instance, some will ask you to use a CC0 license. CC0, it means that it's no longer yours and there is no link between your data and yourself. So this is the one to be avoided. So you really have to think carefully and you, it's painful, you have to read the term of service. It's really important. If you go to uh, Rochard at Agouf, it's pretty safe, but not that safe. Uh, it's based on Dataverse and the, the standard setting of Dataverse is CC0. So I ask them to change in CC by SA, which is for me the safest one. Yeah, but you have to be careful. Yeah. We do not own the data. We are the guardian of the data. Okay. And in France, if 51% of the money comes from public funding, the data belongs to humankind. Okay. And this is sometimes difficult to explain to our, some of our colleagues, but we are just the guardians of the data. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
uh, as we all have seen from the uh, many open science uh, initiations are critically dependent on publishing more so my question is uh i mean it's pretty clear that we should publish more but uh when should we stop can we think of some criterion when should we stop i mean maybe it's good to publish the failed experiment but i mean uh, should we publish our calibration curves for all our equipment? There clearly should be a border. How can we think of some criterion or maybe there are some uh, institutions which are developing these projects for uh, this question? Good question. Um, I will go back about um, material methods on a regular paper, which are at the, at the end of the paper. Usually, for producing the results you put in the paper, you had a huge amount of uh, files, maybe a protocol of six pages with figures and tables, and, and 10 of these six uh, pages of protocols. And you are asked to summarize this in one small column because you have to fit in the 2000 uh, words limit or something like that. So you, you uh, Modify the data for them to fit. There is another option. You can publish all of this separately, even if uh, in an um, unreviewed process. If you go to Zenodo, you can put whatever you want there, and you will obtain a DOI. You can do this very carefully, very, very nicely, with a lot of metadata. And add this DOI to your publication. So people will have access to everything you did. And uh, if I, I would say that uh, when you will ask for a position, this could be very positive. Okay. We have to share everything, but not under the uh, uh, peer review private publisher system. Okay. I do that quite a lot. I was I was late uh, preparing a report and I had to obtain a DOI for once for something I would like to add. So I went to Zenodo. If, if I don't like Zenodo that much because it's uh, there is no quality control, but I, I put my stuff there. I listed the, the ARC ID of my colleagues and it was available in one hour. And I just had the DOI in my, uh, my report and that's it. Uh, it doesn't cost a lot of time. It doesn't cost money at all. And it helps going in the right direction. Okay. Yeah, I have a, a question about the changing the rules, and particularly. Uh, in the rest and in France, the government and this new law that was recently published. Um, how do we go from that to implementing in the lab? Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, talking, uh, mentioning earlier that sometimes we have resistance. Uh, some of us are old enough that we don't have to change. Um, and do you have a feeling for whether that is happening? Uh, and um, it, is it something else required other than just to reach and our minds and culture to implement those things that uh, can just be to the end pieces of paper if they're not implemented? So for me, there are no one answer. There are many other options. Um, first of all, we have to go ahead with the people who right now agree to do this. And do not try to fight with those we well, for the moment disagree. So, um, with uh, Ibiza, Ibiza is a funding agency for uh, uh, facilities. We started a, a cycle of uh, uh, trainings for these facilities to provide uh, fair data to start with. So, the data that will leave the facilities will be extremely well documented. So, this is the starting point. At the end, you have the repositories. We will be working with the repository for them to make clear that there is a quality control at the end for going into the repository. So the data will start being clean, and we expect it to be clean at the end. And so you will then uh, narrow the gap between the uh, uh, producing facilities and, and, and the repository. 
And so the scientist in between will be you know, uh, pushed to uh, change the habit. Plus, uh, I give a lot of talk. We have a training at EFB called Per Data, which is uh, five days uh, online about uh, fair data management. And another one called Fair Bioinfo, which is the same length about <coughs> science. We have to do this. And in INRAE, we we now evaluate the scientists for what they have produced in peer review journals, but also preprints, data sets, codes. And I'm free to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was great. I really appreciate that. Um, so I have, a, I have a question. A lot of uh, the resources you shared are great, fair data. Sharing fairsharing.org is a good example of, of my question, which is there's the long tail of data, right? So when we think of data generation, and, and your example of genomics is a good one, where we know that shoot at this point it's probably cheaper to resequence than it is to store the data. That's how that's how crazy it's getting. But a lot of the data, especially in the project that I explained, isn't that data. It's it's tons and tons of different smaller data formats, right? Western blot data, PCR data, right? Like go on and on and on that don't have mature repositories or even mature metadata, to be honest with you. Um, and then I'm speaking a little bit of like my former self, which is it's overwhelming, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of journalist repositories now, Dryad being one of those, right? That are trying to tackle this question, which is there's no mature metadata like you have in like a genomics database or repository, but you still want to do everything you said. So do you have any recommendations? I mean, this is as much for myself as I'm sure it is for the students, which is like, how do you tackle this question of uh, is my job to do 20 cans all by myself? It'd be a lot nicer if it was just one can. So I don't know if you have any yeah. thoughts on that. Okay. Um, and recently, so we have a, a mail in the campus. You can mail to everyone in the campus if you have a question. And, uh, and um, last year, two years ago, someone said, I really want an electronic lab notebook. It seems to me that this is very uh, important for my research. He said, and I answered with that. It's amazing. I've been told that for 20 years okay, that we still don't have a good electronic lab notebook. So this is something that everyone wants, but we can't produce. Now, today, in France, you have CNRS and INSERM. So INSERM is like the NIH. Okay? Um, one decided to use one electronic lab notebook based on LabGo, and the other one decided to use eLab FTW, and they are not compatible. So sometimes I lose my uh, optimism. So now at EFB, we are trying to build uh, an interface between the two, and we are. So sometimes it's, it's really bad. And uh, so this is the point. Uh, we really finally need a good electronic lab notebook. And, and one is successful because there is no constraint. So people, we are messy on a, on a paper notebook. They will be messy in the system, but they feel much better. The other one is less successful because it does what I would think should be done. It puts some rules. So it's difficult to find a good solution. Maybe we should let people be messy on an electronic lab notebook and then try to improve the quality time after time. And, and this is a problem. And for the repository, uh, you need in your community a, a, a specialized repository for your work. And sometimes it's not available and nobody will pay the money to build this. So I finally find some people who are extremely clever and I was upset not to think about this before them. What they did, it's a community of um, a brain uh, imagery, imaging. They decided, uh, they discussed about the list of the metadata they can use, the minimum metadata for their use. They created a website, not a repository, a website which you can drop your data set. They will check the, the, re, the metadata are correct. If this is so, they will push it to Zenodo. Zenodo will give back a DOI. And Zenodo will pay for the hard drives and the electricity. And, uh, and so they will have provide a, a web interface where you can query the data sets, 
have a pre-visualization. If and if you like that, you click and it, they will go to Zenodo and they will provide you the file. And this is extremely smart. So maybe this is a solution. You just have to create one website and convince your colleagues to use a, a minimum uh, metadata standard. So sometimes yeah, open science, as we are doing it, it's like we are learning uh, to ride a bicycle while at the same time we are building the bicycle and at the same time we are looking at us doing that to see if we can improve both processes it's funny i consider it's funny it's like jogging on the ice bank uh, during the summertime <laughs> well, the bears with the frozen ice and stuff like that. <laughs> Maybe I will allow myself a, a small comment. Um, there is one aspect that you didn't touch upon, and which is really related to the, what you've been speaking when you presented, you know, the data deluge and all these uh, uh, sometimes wonderful consequences of digital revolution, uh, is that uh, you have just said sometimes storing the data is much more expensive than regenerating the data. And uh, uh, maybe it's uh, a, a little bit overused as argument, but as you know, storing the data requires energy. And right now we are in an energy crisis. And it is, uh, um, I have become acutely aware of the consequences for our community which is uh, where we're generating biological data. Uh, it's not specific to cancer, it's any, any field in biology that's producing data. Uh, and because last month I was, in the, I'm part of the, e, of the board of ENA, which is the European uh, Nucleotide Archive, which stores all of the sequences. It's, in a, it's the equivalent of SRA in the United States. Um, and uh, last year, their electricity bill was, for their service was 8 million pounds. And 2023, it is multiplied by three. So uh, if ENA goes down, if it is not able to store our data, uh, there will be a huge collapse in lots of fields. I'm not, probably not cancer. But for example, evolution, which relies uh, on a lot on storing in those public repositories, uh, uh, will be impacted hugely. So there is a big issue of rethinking the uh, financial models and, and also the sustainability for energy. And uh, uh, do you, in your, in your knowledge, are these like more old people questions uh, currently being addressed? Uh, I will start with this. I've been running uh, computing facilities for years, and we had one uh, storage you had to pay, no? and one storage near the computing facility, the computing power, which was free. This was supposed to be a temporary storage during the calculation. This storage was full at 90%. Whatever the size of this storage, we started with a 10 terabytes, it was full at 90%. We increased 40, it was full at 90%. We increased at 300 terabytes, it was full at 80%. So if there is no constraint, people will produce that. But this is clear. Um, now we got some, uh, we got the full PLPR, so we got some uh, five minutes to, to uh, re question biodiversity to face uh, climate change. So, you know, biologists, you give them uh, four millions before they resequence everything. So, they decided to sequence all of the plants we have in France and all the animals we have in France to check the biodiversity and to see if we could improve. The rare variety we cultivate and we win. And so you give money to a biologist who will produce data. And in that case, it's one petabyte. Okay. So I do not question the idea of uh, exploring biodiversity. So I will not forbid them to do that. But I am forcing them to store 
this petabyte on one facility, just one, because this is one of the best in terms of electricity and energy. Plus, it's less expensive to have one petabyte in one place rather than to let people from all over the country to have storage spaces all over the place. Plus, it will be in my, uh, in my office. And so it will not get lost. I don't want to have the problems the uh, European Commission has. So this, the, the raw data will remain under my supervision. And at least I will be able to uh, share them after a certain amount of time. OK. Um, uh, last but not least, I would love to decide what to delete. And you mentioned it's less expensive to re-sequence, but you delete your old sequence. And a historian wants to get back in time to understand some decisions that were made, for instance, during the COVID crisis. And you don't have the data from, uh, upon which the decision were made. You have lost something. So I love to, to delete data. But, and, and during our trains at EFB, this is the most uh, hot uh, moment in the training when we have this game of what do we delete? And people can be very, very uh, hot when this is delete. Maybe intermediate data should be deleted very fast. So that means that you have to use a workflow management system like Galaxy or SnakeMate, which will automatically tag once for all, all the uh, intermediate data. So every uh, couple of uh, days, weeks, months, we have a coin that will write this out. Okay, plus we are closing down a lot of um, uh, storage facilities in France. We plan to, uh, to go from uh, three to 3,200 into 32. Yeah, yeah, but amazingly, it works. I, 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 at the beginning, I said it, that people will buy it. Um, uh, no, finally, it works because it's less expensive. Okay, and for instance, in Toulouse, there is a helmet, and they use a liquid cooled computer, and they take the heat of these computers to provide a heating system for all the neighborhood. So it's quieter for people working in the, in the room. And it's very efficient. So this is the way. So now, I, I, at the beginning, I thought it, we should ask the biologists to pay for storing the data, so they would be they would clean uh, their stuff. Now I consider we should manage the data for them uh, for free because this is more efficient. Because biologists, it will take a, a, a very much a longer, a big amount of time to train them. And, so you, can, you can train all the people, or you can just grab the data and clean it for them. And it's not related to digital disruption. I'm pretty sure that if we go to a lab here and we go to the minus 80 freezers and I open a door and I open a drawer, you will not be able to explain to me what is in the drawer. And I'm ready to get a lot of money. Okay. Thank you very much, Frederick. Yeah. Thank you.